So to quote um, so Sasha Nikola, who I was talking to about this, this is sort of, you should think of this as morally fun as inequality in the sense that it's using the same argument. I mean, in some sense, you know, fun is equality, I think of now, now after all of this, as a reflection of some underlying geometric packing tricks. And again, people who don't like geometry will not like that analogy, but that's how I think of it. So in that sense, it's using the same argument there. Um, so let me explain what, uh, very quickly, in five minutes or less, what differential privacy is. Um, and it's, so if you're not familiar, if you've heard about this, it's this thing at the confluence of cryptography and data mining. And the setting is that you have some data and you want to release it to the public, okay? But you don't want certain private information to be leaked. In this particular context, the notion of private information will be, is my information in this database that has been released to the public or not? So maybe I'm releasing a, a database of you know, HIV prevalence in the area, and I'd be very upset if someone were to find out that my information was in there, for whatever reason, right? So there's been, you know, this has been, uh, there's been a lot of work in this area, starting from the 70s, uh, you know, so it's in statistics. And I think what differential, uh, and, and I should say that you know, the easiest way to do this is well, just don't release the data. It's very private. But of course, what you end up with is you don't have any usefulness data. So this, in, in the, all these questions, there's this tension between being useful, having the data that people can use, and being private. You can be useful by releasing all the data, and it's not private. You can be private by not releasing data, and it's not useful. How do you navigate the trade off? So there's been a lot of work on this and there's been a lot of attempts to uh, sort of quantify what it means to be private and quantify what it means to be useful. And differential privacy is, a, is an idea that has come, you know, in, in spirit at least from cryptography, of course from, from theory, and it's kind of an elegant way of dealing with this issue, okay? And so let me set up sort of the notation that we'll need just for this problem. There are, again, other ways, it's a much larger area than I can capture in, in five minutes. So we'll define the notion of a mechanism, okay? You should think of a mechanism as the as a release procedure of some kind. So a mechanism M, right, is some collection of probability distributions. So it's a collection of probability distributions um, over um, uh, probability distributions, are, and they're indexed by X in R D. Okay. Distributions over over R D, okay. Um, we will say that a mechanism is epsilon differentially private if for all x y such that x and y are close, more particularly their L1 norm is one, that's equal to one. The induced distributions, mu x and mu y, are the same. And by the same I mean for all S subset Rd, um, uh, actually, let me say it this way, the soup over all S and R D. Okay. Mu X S divided by mu Y S is less than or equal to E to the epsilon. Okay? So this is the standard definition. And let me parse this definition very quickly. So what you're saying is that the idea of differential privacy is that X came in, X is the data. Yeah. X is an RD. Yeah. Mu X is a distribution in what space? Uh, over, it's, it's, it assigns measure to RD itself also. X is an RD and mu X is also a distribution over RD. Yeah. Okay, I, I mean, in, yeah, yeah, that's right. And you think of X as your data, some long string of data, okay? So X is coming in and some sample from mu of x is being released. That's what's happening, okay? That's the mechanism. That's what, no, no, x is your data coming in. No, 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 so sorry, I, yeah. So x is your input, your mechanism does something to x, it's a stochastic procedure, and it outputs some, da some, some published data that is drawn, think of that as being drawn from the distribution mu x. 
right? So for x, you have some distribution mu x of what you're going to output. For y, you have some other distribution of mu x, mu y when you output. Now you, the attacker, is looking at this output thing. And you want to be able to figure out if it's x or y. If you can do that, you've beaten the privacy of the scheme. Okay? And so what this guarantee is saying is that if x and y are close, then you cannot distinguish these two distributions. Think of e to the epsilon as 1 plus epsilon. So the num for any subset, the distributions look the same. So if you think of, think of again this way. So I have an x and I have a y. x is my data, y is my data. x goes in, my mechanism does something to it and outputs some sample from some distribution mu of x. It does the same thing on y. So there's mu y, it outputs some distribution mu of y. Now I look at any subset, right, and look at how they differ. And what this is saying is that they should not differ by much. So that intuitively, if I took a bunch of samples, I couldn't really tell these two distributions apart. Which means that I could not tell whether my data was x or y. And if you think of x as has my information in it, y as does not have my information in it, they differ by one unit in some sense. This is, I'm unable to tell these two cases apart. And so the, the system is now private. It has concealed my information, presence or absence, from the public. Now, there are other ways you can think about concealing information. This is only one way. But again, that gives you a more general space. So is the, is the statement clear of what it means for the mechanism to be differentially private? Yeah? OK. Well, that's all well and good. But like I said, the challenge here is to balance this against the quality of your mechanism. Right? How good is it at solving whatever problem you want to solve with this published data? Right, because I can easily do privacy if I don't care about that. So that forces me to define the error in this mechanism. Right? In order to do that, let's assume there's some function. So there's, you're computing some function on the data. So you can think of this function as being, oh, I want to compute a clustering of this data. Or I want to compute the, the um, build a nearest neighbor data structure on this data. I want to compute some summary statistics. I want to compute the F2 or the F1 or some other, second, other moments of this data. I want to do things with it. So there's some function, and it outputs something. Okay, Whatever. That's your function that your oracle, right? That, oh, sorry, I should be more careful. No, this is going to be, no, wait. Mm. Um, no, this is going to be D, sorry. There's going to be some deep right. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, OK, sorry. Yeah, in fact, yeah. Um, if I, OK, it would be easier if I just kept it as D. If I do this, I have to be more careful. This has to be D prime here. The mechanism is going to live in the space of the function. So. Output cluster centers or something like that. Yeah. The input to that algorithm is the data. The, the data or the sanitized one? So let me write on the cost function. Oh. Yeah, okay. So. Um, so, so mu x is the distribution over Rd prime, not Rd? So, so for now, let me, you know, let me keep things simple. Just keep them the same for now. And it'll all be clear. Okay. But I'll, let me write down the cost function. So let me define the error of the mechanism. So the error of the mechanism is the worst case over all inputs right, of the expected. So, so imagine, OK, so it's the expected value um, over um, your, your released data sampled from mu of x right, of some loss function between A and F of X. Right, so the, the output of the mechanism is the replacement for the application of F to your data. So in other words, you might want to do clustering on a data. Your mechanism will release a clustering. It doesn't release data, it releases a clustering. So I'm comparing clusterings and clusterings here. Yeah, this is true, but this is the, let me just, yeah, let me, 
verify. Yeah, let me just confirm one thing. But I think this is how it's set up. But uh, I was a bit, I was, to be honest, I was a little bit puzzled by this myself when I saw it formulated this way. But um, uh, that's that's how it's defined. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And in fact, the correct way to say this is that if this is d, this is d prime, and in fact, this will be d prime in general. So the mechanism lives in the target space of F. Okay. So this is a way to capture the idea that the mechanism cannot be arbitrary. It has to be reasonable. If there was some oracle function that was the thing you desired to compute, what you do with the mechanism should be close. Right? If this is your loss function, you don't want to be horrible. So this captures your privacy, and this captures your error. Pardon me? L2. L2. So uh, distance squared, you know. So you have a, you know, if you have a set of clusters and you have the release set of clusters, you look at the L2 distance between them and take the average, and that's your number there, right? So a number that's zero if they're identical, and it gets larger as they get, you know, yeah. Okay. All right. So the the basic sort of property of these mechanisms and differential privacy is that there's this trade-off between these two quantities, between the error and the epsilon privacy. Um, and, um, sorry, where are my notes gone? Okay. Yeah, and by the way, if you want to think of going back to our minimax notion, you can think of this mechanism as basically this is your estimated parameter in some sense, right? This is the true parameter and this is the estimated parameter if you want to draw analogy to that. And so, what you want to say is that, okay, if given a certain amount of privacy, how much error am I going to occur, and vice versa. And so you have to assume some properties of F. It's not, you can't do this otherwise unless you assume some structure in F. Intuitively, if F is very sensitive to small changes, you're going to have problems with maintaining both error and privacy because small perturbations to your data will cause all kinds of huge changes in F. So there's some parameter, I won't tell you what it is, some, there's some way of characterizing the sensitivity of a function. Intuitively, you can think of how much it changes when you make small changes to it, like a derivative. So we'll call this parameter s. So this, every, every function has some sensitivity s. Okay? Did I use s before? This is capital S. <laughs> Sorry. It's capital S. It's a small s. Sensitivity. Yeah, sensitivity. Yes. I'm only allowed to use five letters. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, and so the typical trade-offs you get is that the error, um, the error parameter is going to be, you can show upper bounds of the form some function of the, some function of s divided by the privacy parameter. This is the typical upper bounds you can get. So you can build a mechanism like the Laplace mechanism and others that will give you this kind of behavior. So there's an inverse relationship between these two things. Okay? And what you'd like to show is that these are tight, that there's a lower bound on what you can do in terms of trading off error and privacy. Okay? So that's the goal here. So once again, it's a lower bound. You want to limit what you can do here. Um, I mean, S is, uh, so sensitivity is defined basically by saying that you, if you, let me see, so what is the best way to say this? Um, so you look at the, you basically look at the Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz property of the function. So you look at the, so one way to say this is that um, you take f of x and look at its L1 norm and you, um, and you sort of see how much change. Yeah. So it, yeah, I'm bothered to that. Yeah, so Lipschitz sort of properties come into play. Yeah. So for clustering, you know, it depends on the, the you need, you know, an L2 notion for those things. Gets it, yeah. Okay. I'm just thinking, yeah, what would be a good example? So, so let's say you want to compute. Hmm. 
So, I mean, so even, even if your function is something like, I'm not, a good example is not coming to mind right now. Uh, let me think about that. Um, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I can formally define it, but it's not. You know, that's not what you're asking for. You're asking for an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, the best intuition that I have is basically you. you it's it's like uh, sensitivity in a circuit sense. Also, if you change one input by a little bit, how much is f going to change? Yeah, that's one way to think of it. So again, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sure. Right. Right. Like, okay. So, how do we show? This lower bound. Ah, sorry. Okay. So here's how we're going to do it. So suppose I'm going to take suppose I take a bunch of points in R D. So so let, so let's say I take a point. Okay. So I have R D prime here. So, so I have my space, this is Rd, and then I take f and I go to Rd prime, okay? Let me just take a bunch of points in the space, okay? Which have a certain volume. So this is a sufficiently large um, space. And if I take a set of points such that the volume of this set of points is V, um, so I take a space here of volume V, And if I set r equal to something like v to the 1 over d, d prime, okay? Then you can say that there are going to be a large number of points in this volume that are well separated from each other. So in other words, I want to, find a, I want to basically find a, a packing of points. So I'm going to say, okay, take a, take a set of a volume, and then if it has a certain volume, I can find points in it that are sufficiently far apart. And the sufficiently far apart is basically going to be something like r square root of d prime. This is, all this is saying is that if I take a ball or take a grid, I can put a grid down and take points at certain things which are sufficiently well separated. It's not, nothing fancy about that. So I collect this well separated set of points in this space. Okay. Yeah, there'll be exponential in d prime many. Because you can think of this as like saying if I have a set of this volume, it effectively has the same volume as that of a ball of a certain size. And then I can fill in points that are sufficiently far apart in that volume. I mean, if it's long and skinny, you just poke along that. If it's not, you can. There's always a. This is. There are. You can prove this in many. You know, there are different ways to sort of show this one. But the point is, you can construct. The, the goal here, you, you just have to construct a set of points that are sufficiently well separated. That's all you need to do. So you get the set of points, and then you look at their pre-images in the in the space X with respect to F. Okay. And so, suppose you have a mechanism of this kind that has small error. Okay, so I want to show that this can't be too small with respect to epsilon. Suppose I did have a mechanism that had small error. Okay. Um, so this is where, okay, let me try to do this a bit more carefully. All right. So let's say I have a mechanism. So suppose I have a mechanism has error e, okay, some number e, okay. Now, this error is what? For any particular mechanism and for any particular point, I am looking at this quantity here. So I'm saying that the error is at most e for any any point x, right? So the mechanism, the the, the if I look at the error with respect to mu x for any x, it's going to be at most e. And this is an average mechanism here. Okay? But what that means is that if I choose a ball around x, okay, of radius of radius something like two times e. Okay, so it's a radius two times e. And I look at the mass of this ball with respect to mu of x. So what is the mu x mass of this ball? Right? Remember that I'm, this average value is e. So then if I take 2e, its mass is going to be at least half. It's like a Markov inequality. 
right? So if it's if its error is at most e, then if I you know a ball of radius at most two e cannot have it has to be you know sufficiently big, otherwise my average would be worse than e, right? So this ball has radius has mass at least half under mu x, okay? and um, so now you choose your various parameters carefully. You do this for each x. So now remember, I have all these points. I looked at the pre-images in the space. They're kind of well separated. I haven't specified the radiuses, but they're kind of well separated. I know that for any such ball, its mass under mu x is at least half. And so I chain, make, adjust the radius appropriately to make sure all these balls in the space now are disjoint. So if I draw the picture of what the source space looks like, Rd, I have these balls here that look like this, one for each x, x1, x2, three, four. These are all big balls with respect to the individual measures of the mechanism, okay? Because I've done this separately for each of them. But here's the problem. This, I can, because I can control it. I can, so I want, so I said that if there's an error e, for some parameter e, I get this ball of radius 2e is large. Under mu x. Under mu x. I, I choose my distance of these points carefully to make sure that the distance of a ball is, um, is more than 2e. Uh, yeah, more than 4e, I guess, yeah. That's, so I, so I, I have a degree of freedom to control that radius there to make sure that all these balls are destroyed. That's how I can do it. So again, it's some parameter games you play there to do. That's happening in D prime? That's happening in D prime, and then you do the inverse pre-image there via f. Yeah. So I should say, though, that in this particular proof, I should have mentioned this. So they assumed that in this particular proof, f was a linear map. So you could you you can make assumptions about what f is doing. So, um, yeah. Okay. The you. Yeah. Okay. So now here's the problem. These are all points that have large mass with respect to their own distributions, mu x. Okay. So this is big with respect to mu x one. This is big with respect to mu x two, and so on. But without loss of generality and using some scaling, you can assume all these xi's. So we can assume that the norm of any of the xi's is less than or equal to lambda, some constant. And for now, again, let's just assume it's less than or equal to 1. It's actually not, but just for clarity. Okay? Which means all of these points are at distance less than or equal to 1 from the origin in L1 sense. So if you think of the origin here, these are not very far. They're in an L1 ball around the origin. OK, but now look at the guarantee of privacy. The guarantee of privacy is saying that if you look at the corresponding mu for 0 for the origin, it has to be very similar to the mu for x. So whatever massive, massive ball you got here, it has to be close to the mass of a ball at the origin. OK? Send, uh, the mass of the ball using the measure defined by the origin, okay? So in effect, you can translate the mass, right? I'm looking at the mass of this ball under mu x. I can look at the mass of this ball under mu zero, and it has to be reasonably close to mu x. I look at the mass of the ball mu x one. It again is close to zero, so I can look at the mass of this ball under mu zero. But now I have a single distribution. And now I have a bunch of balls. They're all very big. If these balls are too big, or if there are too many of them, I have a contradiction. So if the error is small, then these balls, then there are many, many of these balls, and they will violate the privacy guarantee. Essentially, what's happening is that, if you remember what we talked about with the minimax, right? They are far in parameter space, but they must be close in distribution space because I'm requiring it by privacy. And both of those things can't happen at the same time. You're going to have tension between them. So that's why I said this is morally like Fano's inequality. I and mean, they're not invoking it explicitly. But they're using the same fact that you have the parameter space in which they are far by this argument. These balls are separate. But you have the distribution space in which they are close by privacy, because they must be close by privacy. This is the notion of closeness here, not the kullback lever divergence. And so by playing those off against each other, since both can't happen at the same time, you get a lower bond. And you get exactly this kind of lower bond. And so that's basically the sort of the example of how the minimax flavor of Fano's inequality can get used as well. How much time do I have? 
What, like 20 minutes, 25 minutes? Or? 35. 35, okay. <laughs> Maybe I won't get to the end, but that's okay. <laughs> Questions? So I, I think as you're beginning to see these, um, what I would have liked personally is that these are kind of straightforward applications, just apply it as a hammer and it just works. And it doesn't always work, but, but the ideas are basically all there. The same ideas that percolate through all this are all in, in these. Hmm. So before I move on, are there any questions? Okay, all right. So if you have to look at, or if, if I want to look at what the, the heart of Fano is, right, the heart of the inequality is, it is this idea of trading off, of creating these distributions that are, you know, well separated in one space, but they're close in another space. And the, the, the creativity is, of course, in how to construct these distributions, but when you do that is when the lower bond kicks in, right? So either you'll make, you know, either you'll, you can't tell them apart because they're too close, or you'll have big error in your estimation because they're, you know, they're far apart. And, but like I said, Fano's inequality is not the only inequality that gets used in minimax estimation. There are many, many others. Two others that are often mentioned are what I call Lacan's inequality and Aswad's inequality. These are other ways of thinking about the problem of uh, minimax estimation. And I want to mention them. A, because there is a direct way to connect all these three inequalities together that reinforces this intuition of distributions that are far in one space and close in another. And it turns out, and this is a paper that I discovered, you know, I think what, maybe a month ago, that someone had pointed me to, that there is a way to formally unify all this by playing games with the way we define distributions are close, by going beyond kullback lieber diversion to something more complicated which I think is also nice, because it lets you prove even more general versions of that basic result right there. So in the time I have left, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about this. This will be not very like much of the rest. I'm not going to be try to be too formal in my reasoning here. I'm going to give sort of a flavor of how these work. But um, my hope is that by drawing this connection out, you can see the many ways in which this intuition just sort of percolates through everything that we understand about fun. So remember, in Fano, we had a family of distributions and a parameter space and a distribution space, right? So, Lacan's inequality can be thought of as another way. Again, you want to lower bound your minimax error, and I'm not going to prove the bound, but the way you construct the bound is by doing the following. Rather than having a whole collection of, of, of distributions, you have two sets of distributions. And so, um, so what you do is you Um, so let's say now you have two sets of parameters instead of a whole collection of them. So I have two sets of parameters. This is, this is parameter value one and this is parameter value two. And let's say they're again well separated in that their closest distance is at least two delta. Okay, so these, in parameter space, they're far apart. Right? Just like we had those big balls here. We have something like this here. Okay. And... Um, so of course these are that these correspond to two sets of distributions that give you these parameters. So there's you know there's a parameter here, there's a distribution that gives the parameter, multiple distribution that gives the parameter, and they're in some other space as well. And so if you now look at the minimax error, so the minimax error, um, just like before, we wanted to lower bound it, right? Two sets of parameters. There's some bunch of distribution that map to it, right? I mean, it's not always unique, right? So. Before, what we were looking at was two individual distributions of the first 
we looked at the we looked at the collection of yeah we looked at the collection distributions right and, how, and they were packed there we had a whole collection PV. Each each circle well each circle was a ball of radius something around the parameter for the distribution to be precise yeah the the circle wasn't the distribution it was a circle of parameter values around the parameter value for that distribution and they were far apart I, I drew the circles to say they were well, well separated right I mean the idea was that these parameter values were well separated by delta and the way to think about this is to think of a packing because you're you're packing these distributions in packing these parameters in. But the circle is virtual in that sense. That, did I just destroy the last one hour of what I said? Okay, sorry. <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> but, uh, packing of points in a space, I generally think of as you know, the points also, but you also have these invisible balls around them that sort of don't touch. That's why it's a packing, so. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm saying. Well, that, that all this drawing of balls is in the parameter space. It's not in the distribution space, right? Because that's the only space in which I can draw balls like that. Because others in the distribution space, there's no metric, and it's kind of bizarre and crazy. And yeah, so, yeah. So the so just like the Fano inequality said, okay, I can lower bound minimax error in terms of well separatedness of these distributions and some game between the distance and parameter space and distribution space. You can do the same thing with Lacan, and this looks like this: delta times. Um, Technically, this is a um, where you should think of P1 as giving you parameters in theta 1 and P2 as giving you parameters in theta 2. So look at the distributions P1 that give you a parameter here. Look at the distributions P2 that give you a parameter here, such that these two parameter sets are well separated. Then the minimax error is bounded by that term times the the reconstruction term, if you wish, which is controlled by the L1 distance with the distributions. What I basically done is replace KL by L1, in a sense. So this, so you know, and so there's another inequality that gets used in minimax expression, which has the same flavor to it, that you have a term for the parameter and you have a term for the um, for the um, distribution for the dis distribution. Okay. Um, and Aswad's inequality is a f generalization of Lecam that says that, um, let's see, that instead of two, if you have a whole hypercube of, of them, so I have a whole hypercube, you can think of each distribution as sitting at one point on this hypercube. So it's, these are you know, exponentially many in the dimension of the, the hypercube. And the same argument applies if you can show that each adjacent pair is sufficiently distinct in parameter space. So let's say in parameter space, these two distributions, uh, these two parameters have distance at least some alpha. And then, and if you look at any two distributions, they have a L1 distance, which is at least something, then the minimax error is greater than or equal to alpha times some function of the distribution distances. Same as before. And in fact, you can prove Aswad's inequality by applying Lecam's inequality on every edge of the hypercube. It, yeah, okay. So these are all different um, results that have been used for minimax error. And there was a very nice paper by Bin Yu many years ago, where she showed that um, these are all essentially equivalent. But not entirely equivalent, in a formal sense or not, but, but almost up to some small factors, you can, rec you can recreate one from the other. So even though they're all different, you can think of them all as part of the same family of results. But what happened more um, recently, like a couple of years ago, the paper by Chen, uh, Guntu Boyana, and Zhang showed that not only are they related, you can generate them by just tweaking a certain parameter. That by using the right choice of a certain parameter, you can get either Lacan's inequality or Aswad's inequality or Fano's inequality. So there's a, there's a deeper sense in which they're all connected. And the deeper sense is in which in the sense in which you, how you measure the distance between distributions. So if you remember, if I make a little table here, I had said that, so for Fano, I was using KL divergence between distributions to measure closeness. And for Lacan, and also for Asuad, 
I'm using L1 distance, right? So what's known is that both of these are members of a larger class of divergences. And these are called the F divergences. And if you ever had the misfortune to muck around in sort of, you know, the geometry of information, you sort of know these things. And the Hellinger distance, of course, is also another one of these things. So this is class of distances called the F divergences that basically say plug in a convex function f and out pops a distance measure. And I'll tell you how they're constructed. And so if you plug in the right, if you plug in f equal to x log x, you get kl. You plug in f equal to x minus 1 divided by 2, you get L1. You plug in f equal to square root x, you get Hellinger, and so on. You can generate a whole class of distances with them. And so it turns out that they prove this general, generalized Fano type bound in terms of this function f, so that by plugging in the right value of f, you get any bond you want. So it's even more general than that. Okay. And um, so let me see. And so to understand why they did this, it's helpful to go back to this original Fano's inequality form here. So if you recall, we assumed that we were drawing x uniformly from 1 through m, which is why we could replace that in conditional entropy by this. So x drawn uniformly from 1 through m. We also had a loss function, the probability of error. And the probability of error was a 0 and loss. It said, OK, either you get the answer or you don't get the answer. Right, so. And so the question they were asking was, what kind of bound do you get here if you don't have this and if you don't have this? Can you get a more general bound that recovers this specific bound that you have here? And so, um, so Ducci and Wainwright had a, a generalization of this bound already in one of their works. And then uh, these folks came along and generalized that even further. And so to give you a flavor of what it looks like, the generalized version of funnel that they're able to get looks something like this. some constant here, divided by log of the soup over all A um, the measure. So let's say there's some. Um, there's some measure over the parameter space that we're working with, some prior. It's not uniform. So measure of all theta such that the loss of theta A is equal to 0. OK. So this is the original Fano inequality. This is the bound they're able to show. And what this means is that instead of having uniform measure over your parameter space, assume you have some arbitrary prior over your parameter space, W. And now look at the set of all theta that have a zero loss for a particular A and take the largest such value of that. And the log of that is 1 plus that is your Fano bound. And if you think of what's happening here, this number is basically 1 over n. If you take a uniform x and you look at what are the, what are the number of instances for which I get a zero loss, is only one thing, so that's 1 over n. So you get minus log n, and then minus log m, and then minus log m. You get that. And the way they prove this is by constructing a generalized version of a generalized expression for this bound using f divergences. And so I was originally going to go into some more details on this, but I feel like um, it's you know, a little bit more um, technical. And I don't know if it doesn't have as clean an intuition as I would have liked to sort of explain. Let me at least define what an f divergence is. So given a function f, df of p comma q is equal to the integral of f of p divided by q d um, uh, q q d mu, where mu is some joint measure of these things. Or in a more discrete world, summation f of p over qi times qi. Okay. 
Again, this is not um, symmetric, like most of these information measures are not. Um, and if you plug in f equal to appropriate values, you get you get this, you get Helen Jernigan. So the technical meat of their paper is basically to say that if you apply the same kind of reasoning with distributions that are far apart, but measure far in terms of an appropriately chosen f divergence, then you get an appropriately defined equivalent of mutual information for an f divergence. Thanks. And then that gives you the bound you want. And so for particular cases, you can simplify this. Again, this is not something that I want to go into anymore. Yes. So good. Let me do that. This is there's also earlier work by I think this was twenty thirteen. I have I, I will is there um I don't know any of the organizers are uh, here. Is there a way to put up the uh, like uh, references or something with slides? I mean, you're going to put the videos anyway. I mean, I don't have slides, but can I put up references and sort of? I have no, my notes that I've written down. Let me go ahead and I'll see if I can. Okay, yeah. So I will. I want to put this up there, and this is uh, 2014. Um, oh no, I don't want to put it up right now. But I'm saying eventually on the website, if I can put it up, people can access oh, sorry, it. Yeah. Will that be possible to do? Or okay, good. So I'll do that. Yeah. Um, let me see what else. And so this this relationship between Lacan and Aswad was by Bin Yu, and this is a paper from many years ago. I don't remember exactly when. Um, this was in a retrospective. Uh, yeah, I don't have the I don't have the actual. I'll, I'll have to figure this one out. But this is by Bin Yu, and so. There's a Berkeley connection going through all of this. So she's at Berkeley, he's at Berkeley, and he, well, he was at Berkeley. He's at Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay. I have a few minutes left. So this one is 97. 97? Thank you. This one is, yeah, 2014, I think, this paper. Yeah, this one, and I want to say it's Annals of Stats, but I'm not sure. And yeah, this is on the archive. All these are on the archive, so they're all easily accessible. So his work was actually from Yale. He was, you know. Which one? The, the book, the book. This one? Oh, this was before he moved to Berkeley, or? Yeah, he actually had a, a paper at TIT from, as a student, Yale student. Ah, okay, okay. Because uh, when I looked at the, well, I guess by the time it made it to the journal, it was actually. Uh, because I have an archive, actually I have a 25th, I have an archive 2014 version, which has his affiliation as Berkeley, but maybe by the time it appeared, you know. No, 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 actually he had a 2011 paper, yeah. which does have divergence, and the new paper is an extended version. You know, ah, okay. Yeah, so this is the one that I'm using, the on the base risk lower bones. This yeah. is the one, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So I have a few minutes left, um, and um, I kind of went through this very quickly. So, but I want to spend the last few minutes just talking about another area that sort of, so I bumped into Fano's inequality when I was, so first of all, when I was reading Regev's paper on um, lower bounds for dimensional reduction L1, because we were looking at dimensional reduction for information distances, and we have, we have a paper on this that's coming up in AI stats, but anyway. And then a second time I read the, about Fano's inequality was when you're trying to prove lower bounds for our nearest neighbor data structures under these Bregman divergences, which is another family of nasty information distances, including KL. And the third time I came across Fano's inequality was when I was doing this work that I've been doing recently on algorithmic fairness. And so let me talk a little bit about this here. So in machine learning, right, you can think of the basic problem is one of, so binary classification, let's say. Right? So I have some data and I want to classify it. So you can think of this as a reconstruction problem where I'm given an X and I want to reconstruct its label. Okay? And so not surprisingly, this is one of those cases where you can apply Fano's inequality directly to give, the, give a lower bound on the efficacy of any binary classification problem under some distributions on your input. So you have some distribution on zero instances, one instances, and you can give the lower bound for a binary classifier. And this lower bound for the binary classifier is in terms of the accuracy of the classification. Okay? So in some sense, you can say that somehow there's an underlying information content in the system that your classifier may be able to achieve. So you can flip this around and say, 
if I have a classifier that, can ex that, is, that fails to succeed with a certain probability, then there's a certain amount of, then there's not enough um, information in the system. I have destroyed any correlation of the system. If, there is, if the classifier is able to succeed, then there is more information in the system and I can actually extract it. We've seen how this gets used in the context of privacy where you want to destroy information, right? You want to hide things. Another place is where, this is where, the, where we are interested in using this was that, suppose you have a data set and you have an algorithm that's making predictions from this data set. And what you're worried about is that the algorithm is discriminatory. And I don't mean discriminatory in a kind of discriminative versus generative. I mean discriminatory as in it's biased against, say, it's, it's racially biased or it's gender biased or something like that. And so the obvious solution to this problem is to just strip out the information that could reveal someone's race or gender. But what is also obvious is that this is not going to help you if there are correlations. If there's a strong correlation between, for example, your name and your gender, which is true in sort of, at least in the US, you can predict someone's gender from the name with a reasonably high probability. Not high, but reasonably high. So just removing the offending attribute, if you wish, not the offending, but the protected attribute, which is what the term is called, is not enough. And so what you'd like to say is, give a theorem of the kind, if I cannot predict the attribute that I've just removed from the rest of my data, then there is not enough information in the rest of the data to infer that. In other words, replace an information theoretic statement about, inform about the, the data with a computational statement that I can actually test. And so Fauna's inequality is very helpful there because it gives this connection between what the information system actually is and what you can predict with the classifier. The problem comes in is that if you don't want to use accuracy as your measure of, as, uh, as your measure of quality. So for many reasons, accuracy, which is basically number of misclassified examples, is not the best way to go about evaluating a classifier. If you have, if you have for example, class imbalances, then if you, are, you can be very accurate on the big class and very inaccurate in the small class and you won't see a difference, but you want to pay attention to that. You may have classes where a false negative is much worse than a false positive. This is, I guess, the principle the entire transportation security administration is based on, that you know, false positives are fine and false negatives are bad, which is why we all suffer. But there are actual cases where this could be a problem, right? where you don't want any false negatives. So then you have an imbalance in cost, and again, you can't apply this bound directly. You have uh, in information retrieval, there's this notion of precision and recall, where you want to make sure that of the things you get, you get good stuff, and that you get a lot of good stuff as well. And that's, again, there's a trade-off there, and there's a thing called the F-score, which is different from accuracy. So the question then becomes, how can you, is there an equivalent of Fano's inequality in the setting where your notion of loss has now changed from this kind of straightforward, you know, made a mistake to something which is slightly skewed? So there's a paper in JMLR from uh, 2013. This was by so this is by uh, Zhao um, um, Edakuni, um, Pocock, and Brown. And they did basically this. They said, okay, so the title of the paper is Beyond Fano's Inequality. And the goal was to come up with Fano's inequality type bounds to give lower bounds on the efficacy, efficacy of certain classification when you're not measuring error based on accuracy, but you're measuring error based on the balanced error rate or cost sensitive error rate and things like that. And so they not only came up with bounds, they came up with a mechanism by which you could construct your own lower bounds. So the results themselves are kind of murky. I don't think we've seen the last sort of of the story yet. And I'm interested in looking at this some more. But they've made this attempt to generalize Fano in a completely different direction. Not in the geometric direction per se, but in this direction of changing the cost function that you're working with. And so that's the other interesting generalization of Fano's inequality that I bumped into. The reason it came up in my work is because, for, again, for this work on discrimination, you have to change the cost function. You need balanced error rates. You need to just make sure each group is evaluated fairly. And then you want to be able to say something about how, theoretically, about whether you've actually removed information about a protected group or not and you can't use these standard bounds anymore. So I think I'll, I'll stop right there. Uh, thank you all for listening and all your questions and discussion. I hope this was a, uh, I was a reasonable tour guide through this space. Um, there's many more things to learn and I'll put up the references and you know, there'll be more precis precision in those things. So, but thank you all for listening to me. <laughs>